Thank you all for being here. I'm Joe McKenzie. This is my speaking partner, Tyler Slinger. We're from uh, the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. We have uh, been speaking together about a year and a half now at our state convention. We've been keynote uh, speakers in the, in the evening to talk about some of the topics that we're bringing here this week, and this is our fourth and final one that we've had. And uh, like I said, I am honored to be able to share the stage with Tyler. Um, he wrote his first book before the age of 30, and he ran for St. Paul City Council at the age of 25. And believe me, I'm nowhere near 25 anymore, times two. I'm honored to be able to stand up here for the millennial, a millennial that I can have a conversation with. I'm honored that we can exchange ideas. We don't share perfect aligned political paths here or political views right now, and I think it's important in today's society to be able to talk about anything in reality, religion, politics, everything that goes along with it. We should be able as a society to embrace civil discourse. All generations can, all generations have benefited from it <clears throat> if they applied it. And we know the negative outcomes of not having civil discourse and the lack of civility. And there's no way in result of what's happening with the D's and the R's. We did this a year and a half ago before the Republican nominee for president um, uh, announced. And some people think that because you know we're talking about this, it's because of that individual. It's not. It's within our own liberty or libertarian movement that we're out here um, sharing the stage. So like I said, I'm honored to be able to stand up here with Tyler. He brings, he compliments what I bring. And, uh, and so, yeah, well, and I'm on the stage with you too, Joe. Uh, so, Joe McKenzie, uh, radio talk show host, uh, career coach, mm -hmm. uh, my mentor, as well as my friend. Uh, and the, my, again, my favorite fact about Joe is he has three 14 year old triplets. Uh, so, <laughs> part of our observation, and Joe and I actually didn't know each other more than I think like two, maybe two and a half years ago, we were introduced through a mutual friend, all of us libertarians. Uh, all of, all of us have come in at various points and times of different ideologies. Um, but he made the introduction to Joe, and Joe and I started having conversations about the things that we've been observing locally with our you know, county parties and our kind of our state party. And even though we agree with many of these people, um, sometimes the conversations we were having were just unproductive. Where they, we weren't enjoying our time that we were spending with all these other libertarians, which we thought we should, because these are people that we share a common goal, common ideology. We should at least be enjoying the time together, even if we're not agreeing. And it didn't seem like that was uh, that was coming across. So I kind of we, we observed this independently, and so when we kind of came together, we kind of started sharing experiences that we had been having throughout the year, whether it be with some of our political candidates being Dutch aggressive, or you know some of our key activists kind of coming in and uh, almost taking our new people and pushing them out because they were just too intense. Um, even though again, passion is great, but you have to be able to kind of dial it down. I become friends with you. So knowing kind of what Joe does, uh, in fact, it, he takes people who are in their beginning of their career, middle of their career, kind of the later stages of their career, and transitions them into either careers that are more meaningful for them or uh, that they're you know, looking for uh, promotions, that sort of thing. Joe teaches people soft skills that they can use in their interviews, and I thought this might be a very good idea to, to bring some of our brothers and sisters in the Liberty Movement um, to work on some of these soft skills to improve ourselves not only for the benefit of us all, but also for our own personal benefit, right? So some of the, the techniques and things that we, we take and swear out of Joe's kind of, uh, in his ring, his match that he uses in his daily work helping people to, to help our, our liberty movement as a kind of whole. So that's kind of the, the origin story, you know, the Batman origin story or whatever. So. Yeah, we, we, we felt it very important to, to bring this to national. Um, we, we've seen it this weekend where people are going to walk away unproductively mad at each other, and we would rather reverse that productively disagreeing with each other. But we can all learn from each other. We've all grown up in different parts of the country. Yep. We're all different ages. We've all been raised by different set of parents. We've all had different education backgrounds, professional backgrounds, what have you. We all have a gift to each other. Tyler said yesterday, a conversation can be a gift for someone. And we talk about how in today's society, what it's become. And this, we work with images here. We don't do so much on the, the PowerPoint words, but that image right there 
shows a clear winner and a clear two losers sitting there. And a lot of conversations that are win at all costs. Do you agree with that, Tyler? Absolutely. You see that and you've seen it this weekend. Anything you'd like to share that may be relevant to that slide? Uh, not only this weekend, but what really kind of percolated for me, being a millennial, we're so attached to our, our cell phones. You got the Facebook app, you're on it, you're arguing with people. You can't even have a face-to-face -face conversation with sometimes with some of my peers um, without them pulling it up and kind of the phones in between us. And so the other piece that I noticed with that is that not only on like the libertarian message boards and the, the Facebook pages, there seems to be kind of this, <clears throat> this one upmanship that we're just gonna we're gonna argue for argument's sake, whether it be to drive likes or views or page views or whatever it is to those pages, rather than actually kind of pushing the conversation forward, whether it be for intellectual gain, whether it be for organizational gain, there's, it seemed like it was argumentation simply for the, the thrill-seeking and the emotional kind of turmoil that it causes, rather than any sort of productive cause. So I saw a lot of time being wasted on top of it. Rather than having activists go out and talk to voters, or talk to one another, or you know, try to build a new affiliate, or you know, reach out to a new group, we're spending time online arguing with one another about things that it might be the minutia um, of the party, stuff that we're not going to solve through argumentation. There's going to have to be a piece of evidence or something that comes forward. But that, that was my kind of one of the first pieces of percolation. And we've seen it this weekend for sure. There's been <clears throat> many candidates who are probably great people that we'll never know. Because the first interaction that we had with them was just friends, where they came up and you know had no interest in some of our delegation and just said, you know, we want you to vote. This and this is what I stand for. See you later. You know. I have no interest in whatever else you, you guys have to bring. So, <clears throat> and so we've seen that this week too. I don't know. Is that is that? And again, not you elaborate, but again, that no, it, it's 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 been a few times, but yeah. you know, obviously the the, <clears throat> the origin of this this presentation was what we were seeing out there. We were going to first call our presentations the return of cannibalism, yeah. where we just take each other out this this liberty litmus test, and how we just. We want to keep, it, it was this drive to keep our club exclusive and small versus growing it and understanding that everybody in this room is not going to agree 100% on anything. But we can certainly agree to listen and, and engage in that simple discourse. And that's why we're doing this. Yes, we're singing. When, when this time of this, this presidential election year, there, it's campaign, campaign, campaign. We're zigging with personal growth. We feel that the libertarian movement can grow by individuals growing as a people. Harry Brown is one of my influences, knowing that when you can help people grow, they may adopt some of the things that you believe in. You're not forcing them, but they may adopt them. And so that was that was one of the big reasons we traveled from Minnesota here this weekend is to adopt this. We want to work with key activists, we want to work with candidates. Yep. We've had heard some very good stories from candidates here that they set their default to listen. And they've run for office and they've been successful because they understand where someone's coming from and they can adopt their, what they've learned in those listening sessions in the field and provide solutions for them, or at least propose solutions. So, yes, we, we want to move away from conversations that become win, win at all costs and there's losers and there's winners. We want to be positive. Because we feel that these conversations those are someone planting a seed. We've talked about it in other seminars where it may not be the smartest person in the world that's going to help liberty grow or libertarianism grow. It might be the best farmer that plants the red seeds in a, in a, in a genuine, um, thoughtful way. It could be a resource. It could be a website. It could be a book. It could be just leading by example. It could be that we have one seed that takes root. Not all seeds take root, but helping someone grow through one seed is obviously our method of growing the returns. Not only that, uh, Joe, kind of the identification of when seeds can be planted. Uh, we had at our state convention uh, a fun debate between the radical wing and the more practical wing. You know, people like that sort of stuff. Uh, but <clears throat> there's always the conundrum, right? right? Debates can get a Trumpish, we'll call it, right? They can get bombastic and you know, people just throwing mud just to throw mud. Uh, so there's a conscious choice in the discussion among the participants to uh, the, the, the gauge of the winner of the debate would not be the, you know, whoever got the best.
best one line around. It would be who plants the most seeds. And that was essentially the, the objective of all the debaters. Is you, we understand that we have some political differences or some ideological differences, but let's see, if, can you get somebody to look at an issue in a different way? And that is going to be the new metric with which we gauge our country. And we, I think we were quite successful. It was fun, we had a good time. You know, there were a couple of one-liners, once or twice, it was all good humor. And I think everybody walked away from that energized. And there were many people, I think, that you know, crossed back over and they were having good conversations after the fact. That's right. I didn't take part in it, but I watched it. I'm not, I, that's not my strengths. I, I watched how the crowd responded to it. And Matt Dome Tyler, one of the younger ones up there, was one of the, the better planters of seeds that I saw and potentially could be taken with since then. So, hold on. Well, the other, the, the other aspect of growth, too, Joe, that we've, <coughs> we've talked about is so often, sometimes, it feels that political parties are externally motivated. Uh, we've kind of put our locus of control outside. And there, we obviously have to do that, right? If we're going to change public policy, we have to get more people to vote. Uh, we have to get more candidates to run. But oftentimes, it seems that there is kind of a hollowing out. At least uh, it had been locally for many years where activists get burned out because there's really no personal growth in the party. There's nothing that people are gaining from showing up to our meetings other than going out and petitioning. And people aren't actually taking anything away themselves. Um, so we thought that this would be another, this is a great place to identify and apply libertarian philosophy. Where the idea is, is that if an individual grows, if you're self-interested, both parties benefit. So if we can teach our activists to be uh, more compassionate, uh, better listeners, they're going to reap the positive benefits in their own lives and in their global careers as well. So uh, the example, the quintessential example, like if you become a better listener, <clears throat> you're going to be a lot better at job interviews. You're going to be able to communicate better on the job with people and be able to listen to your customers or your, your bosses or whoever you're, you're trying to gain feedback from and apply that more readily. Uh, if, you know, if you're in a relationship, your wife, your husband, you're listening more effective, you're going to have stronger marriage, which means you can do more uh, successfully. So it's not just the, the growth that the party has, but the individual can't be hollowed out on behalf of the party or not. And ultimately, our goal could be that by growth, by helping someone else grow, that they could live a freer life. Who has read Harry Brown's book, How I Live Freedom in a Free World? That was the book that changed me. Written in 1973, I was in kindergarten. And I read it now, and it's more relevant every year. If I don't like my job, and I feel trapped, or feel like I'm unfree of what I want to do, I have choices. I don't want to fall in that mental trap. So Harry Brown's book helped me to live free. I have choices. But someone recommended that. Well, actually, they didn't even recommend it. They just made an observation that changed the way I thought about how I approach my personal and professional career. That was enough of a seat for me to go out and buy it. The Brown, B-R-O-W-N? E. Yeah, Harry Brown. He was libertarian presidential candidate in 92. 96. Yeah, who's back? Yeah, 92. No, 96 and 2000. There we go. Um, obviously left us too early, um, several years back. But that was enough for me. That's enough for me to help others. Tyler probably had a whole different approach. How, how did you, what seed was planted with you to bring to this point? It's hard to say. It's kind of an experience. Right, like uh, I, had, I had been a Democrat previously. I had went down to the state legislature to uh, to advocate for more government spending, unfortunately. So to my, my much chagrin, I had to go back and try to convince the other people that no, I was wrong. Uh, anyway, let's have this conversation again. I, I was wrong about that. So uh, it was going down there and kind of seeing the political process for me to see uh, how the gears are actually working. Um, we had grandstanding at some of those uh, convention meetings that people were having. So. That kind of, you got, my, you got the ball, it took several years, probably three or four more years until I, I finally kind of fully came around to the idea, but uh, that, was, that was kind of you know, seeing actual politicians in our state legislature, uh, you know, basically grandstand for the camera, as we're trying to have it. At the time, I, I was an open discussion about uh, increase in spending, but yeah, it was. <clears throat> and then the other thing, too, is that the personal, there was that war inside me as I was discussing this, that I felt a lot of personal responsibility for my life, but yet I was going there and advocating government, I had to, I had to at the time, so. I mean, I don't think we've ever really talked about that specifically, but you, know, you became enlightened and you worked through a, a process on your own. Yeah, it wasn't, not, it wasn't not. one particular seed, but there are seeds that plant and there's some experiences that help you. Obviously, you're here to talk about some
some of this. Now, I was talking to Larry over here, and he's not a big fan of the top ten lists. I'm not even. Letterman was funny. Yes, you're sitting, sitting there watching at the end of the day. You can't take a top ten list to the field. It's hard to remember a top ten list. If I throw everything with the kitchen sink at you, it doesn't resonate. So we're going to keep it simple. We're going to do three manageable things that we believe is the keys to effectiveness which we see a lot of people stepping over. And that the cards we made are something we bring back that are on bulletin boards or are given to, to whomever you feel could benefit from it. Because as a society, I talked to J Judge Jim Gray yesterday, the Johnson campaign, and he came over and he knew what we were doing. He goes, we should be able to talk about everything. Do you agree with that? We should be able to talk about and I fully agree with that. But sometimes we need a method or something that stays top of mind. Top of mind. Top of mind. And that's why we put together these three. And after we go through that, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna interact, we're gonna facilitate some some good civil discourse and some ineffective civil discourse, and then leave it up to you to kind of talk about that. We feel it's important. We're not here to talk at you. We just want to introduce some concepts and see if they resonate and see if we can take it to the field. We honestly feel right, that, as I said earlier, the libertarian movement will grow when we grow as, as, as people. Yep. And that is what we believe in, and that's why we travel so Obviously, the first point, bring curiosity. Simple. Five-year-olds are curious about the world. They go, well, what's that, what's that, who's this? They asked a lot of questions, don't they? But as adults, we seem to fall in this trap, or I'm gonna use some very wrong mental trap of, well, I'm not curious anymore, I just wanna tell the world. But I'm curious about your stories. I wanna know about everybody, why they're here today. Everybody has a different journey. Kevin, one of our speakers this week, Kevin Fortune, ladies and gentlemen, the King of Liberty, who traveled here from Atlanta to speak told us about his story. It was Friday's, right? It was Friday's seminar that he talked to us about, about his. And it was a unique journey. And that intrigued me about having more conversations with Kevin. But if I approached Kevin and just said, this is who I am, this is what I want to do, and just and never have any curiosity about Kevin, we, it may just stop there. But because we both brought curiosity to the table, this conversation could keep going, could it, Kevin? Six months from now, online, type of what, what happened. So bringing curiosity. And Tyler has an observation that I didn't see, but I think it's very applicable to this. When you not you're not bringing curiosity to the, to the, to the conversation. What, what's happening? If you're going to go on the flip side of it, you flip the coin over, if there's a lack of curiosity, but you're still talking to someone, it kind of seems a little uh, awkward and weird. It makes the conversation weird because it's one-sided. Uh, you're kind of taking command of their time and their energy and what they're doing. You're kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep talking at you, even though you're like, oh, I don't necessarily want to keep talking. And there is, not only are you taking their time, um, it's not putting a good feeling uh, inside people. So there, it, it has kind of that duality in it. Yeah, and it definitely makes you come across as a smart, seemingly the smartest person in the room if you don't care about what they have. Your view is more important at this point, correct? Correct. And that's yeah. what you're picking up on when there's the lack of curiosity about something. You know, I'm curious, you're, you're family here, right? Where, what state? Florida. Florida, oh, okay. So you, is this your first national convention? Yes. Uh, I'm curious, as a family here today, what brought you? I'm curious. As a family, we, we don't see a lot of families here, but this is refreshing. Why are we here? My dad's introducing us to the Libertarian Party. Yeah. I've been here for a while. He came together. He recruited us. What's that? He recruited us. He recruited us. But he's brought you into a, a place where you, you're going to see resources. You're going to see a 
individuals. You're gonna look, you're gonna walk away knowing more than you, you did show up, right? And, and, and for you, because you, you reacted to that, that, that that's your search for more knowledge, right? Yeah, you want you know you can apply it in your own mind. Yeah. That's what I like to hear. Because a young man right here could find a resource, could find a book, could find a website, could find a person, a connection that exists that helps you grow. Thank you for sharing. What's that? Thanks, Corinne. Yes, exactly, exactly. So mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen a family from here, but that's great. I don't know. There's, I've seen, yeah, maybe a couple. That's so but not, it's not the norm. It'd be nice if it was the norm. That'd be kind of fun. Larry, what about you? What brings you here today? First convention? You better tell him. Ask him. How did he brought me here? Man, I'm a nerd, and he needs to drive back to his car in Gainesville where I'm from. And so I was like, okay, I'll come pick up the airport and come to the Libertarian Party National Convention. And I want to spend time. So <laughs> and my wife, our wife's in travel, so it worked out. Good, good. Uh, are you, is it refreshing for you? Oh, yeah. The, the environment? Oh, yeah. yeah. Good, good. You may walk away here with some information you may not have known. Excellent, excellent. So bringing curiosity is the first step. We, we, we seem to have a social media world where it's a me, me, me. A Facebook page seems to, to tend towards this is what I've done, this is what I want to do, but it doesn't ask a lot of people what, how can I help them. And so, yes, I've got 14-year-old triplets, believe me, I know the dynamic. <laughs> I know the dynamic, but I've tried as a father to make sure that they're curious about others and how, how I been successful with that and how I benefited. It's important that all generations embrace that. So bringing curiosity is one of the easiest ways. Here you go, sorry. Can I have that? Okay. Welcome. You're the youngest of how many You can have uh, I actually have number the number seven of eight children, a large Irish Catholic family. And I am the first libertarian. <laughs> For now. Uh, and, and believe you know, and, and they, they're, they're happy that I'm down here. I have an older brother that's a former police officer. I have a, a sister that's a retired school teacher at public schools. They're happy for me. We under, we don't definitely uh, agree on a lot of the things that you know what their professions was, but that doesn't stop them from being happy. So, so bringing curiosity is just a simple way. And as a millennial, standing out. You may find a good connection there that will could last the rest of your professional career. The connections, the quality of connections, are more valuable than the amount of connections. And that's my gift to you. Just nurturing, nurturing. Stay in the moment. Ty, what's your thoughts on stay in the moment? When I say stay in the moment, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I just think meditation. That's kind of my personal like for yoga okay. or something like that. Okay. <laughs> that is a good one because that is a, that is a way to stay in there. Yeah, but stay in the moment. Uh, to me, also, I think of uh, I've said it before. It's kind of like a basic you know? And it's interesting okay. when you kind of juxtapose the idea of of like Facebook, where people are kind of chattering at one another. They're kind of putting something up because they're like, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to me. And it feels like when I see that and when I ask it. Uh, that what they really want, they do want somebody to pay attention to them, but it also kind of seems symptomatic of people haven't paid attention to them. Like they haven't given them that good quality time. Um, <clears throat> and kind of the deep piece. So we've kind of talked about it before, and we talked about it yesterday, Joe, that uh, attention can be a gift. It, it can oftentimes be the only gift that we give people. We can't necessarily give them money all the time or, uh, or effort and labor. Many of us are already busy. We've got jobs, second jobs, and you know, our third job, which is fighting for liberty. Um, so if we if we have the opportunity to talk to voters or anything, one of the three things we can give them is our time, our attention, our 100% focus for the time that we're there. Uh, actually, now that we're talking about this, is actually, uh, it reminded me, I had a seventh grade uh, school teacher. It was interesting, he's also my wrestling coach. So we had a pretty good relationship back and forth. But he said, uh, do what you're doing while you're doing it. Do what you're doing while you're doing it. So if you're going to be you're going to be here at the LP, let's do, let's do this LP thing. But then when you get home and it's family time, Spend time with your family. Don't be spending time thinking about work or thinking about you know school or whatever it is that you have going on. Stay in the moment. Pay attention to the people that uh, that are here in front of you, and you'll get better results. It's kind of like it so the so multitasking it can be good and it can be negative. Yes. We take our offices with us nowadays. It's a 
a lot of times all we need. Right? And a lot of times we when 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we didn't bring our office with us. But the reality is technology permits. And no generation is immune from loving to look at their emails, their, their updates. It's just, it's in the palm of our hand. But how does it feel when you're having a conversation that this, the office keeps coming? In? Yeah, just a minute. Stay in the moment. I teach professional networking, and I say turn your phone off and manage the expectations by saying, if my child calls or my wife calls, it may be something I need to tend to. But everything else is not important right now. Talking with you is important right now. So staying in the moment is so key to having that civil discipline. Would you enjoy if I was? Ask you. No, but it's here. It's so easy. I see a lot of acknowledgments here. Has it happened to you where uh, the civil discourse cannot even take root because of it? They're just so distracted by this. Does it happen? Does that happen? Mm -hmm. Who'd like to share? Well, not only that, it's talking to someone, you see them scan in the room with their eyes. What do you think they're looking for? I think they're looking for an out. They're, they're sending you a message that you're boring them or they're not interested. They want to move on. Something's more important yeah. outside of our little you know, realm. Nonverbal communication is so strong. You can tell the first time, like you said, sir, that they're scanning around for an out, another person, buffet line. Whatever. How does that make you feel when that happens? Uh, it makes me feel annoyed. You know, I, I would prefer them to be more assertive and just say, you know, I I see someone here I need to talk to. Or, you know, just be open and honest and exit as opposed to uh, patronizing. So manage those expectations a little better. Right. Well, I think you need sorry. Edward. Edward. That happens quite a bit. I I, I teach professional. As silly as that sounds, the soft skills of professional networking, the people that sit down with me that I build these connections know I respect their time and they stay with me. And I keep it for simple. And I benefit. My company has grown, my, my opportunities for growth have grown. But I can tell you that if I were to fall into those traps of not staying in the moment or being curious about someone and not engaged in the civil discourse, even conversation, may have not brought those same. So I know that it's prevalent out there, but we're going to stand out. We, can, it, it's, we can't control what we can't control, but we can control ourselves. That's the personal growth. We sit down for meetings. We, we say, Larry, I have 60 minutes today. Does that work for you? We agree upon phone goes away. And I'm not here to talk to you today, Larry. Let's, let's have a conversation. Let's talk with each other. And, we can, and that, that's the basis for that civil Thing. You've said before too, Joe, that you'd rather go a mile deep for the initial I with people, get to know them very, very, very well at one of your advocates, rather than going uh, a mile wide with an inch deep. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the internet seems to fluctuate as the mile wide rather than any sort of depth. You're only getting the superficial piece. They can't remember they had a commercial probably like a year ago where you know, people, oh, I had such a great time. They have post a picture of their food, whatever, they're saying they're eating McDonald's or something, but they're taking fake pictures off of uh, the internet, posting like, my life is so interesting, pay attention to me. My life is so interesting, pay attention to me. And I, I agree. It's that. superficial. It's completely superficial. LinkedIn, some people have 10,000 people that they don't tell. <laughs> it's so easy, you never have to leave your house. But they, I also work with a lot of people with thousands of LinkedIn connections in career transition. Job market is real. The unadvertised job market is real. They're all over the country. And they don't want to embrace it because they don't know those thousands of people that make connections. And the hidden job market is brought through the connections. So, to your point, yes. If you only know somebody in HD, they're not going to vouch for you. They're going to work, you know, work with them or work for a company. They're not going to put their neck out on line for 
elaborate it even a little bit. Um, I'll just tell you, the sheriffs are actually, through kind of this methodology, I recently just got a new job. I'm a software developer. I'm working in a different uh, different part of the company I work for, but it's a pretty big transition for me into a new code base, things that I'm not 100% qualified to do, but I had an internal advocate who I had, I've known for two or three years. We get together quarterly, just kind of meet up, chat a little bit. Um, we had become friends and he had kind of left to come back. Uh, had I not actually spent the time to keep up that relationship and keep chatting with him, asking about his kids, just getting to know him as a man's name is uh, he wouldn't have been able to advocate for me. And I came into that interview uh, with his boss not being the most technically qualified, even though I have a software developer but in a different kind of area, but being the most connected and then sinking the job. That's what it says. <clears throat> if we do that, like, you know, just kind of wheel it back into like, the libertarian idea, if we bring an activist we love on a little bit, we kind of build those deep connections, uh, they're going to be more willing, I feel like, to come back. The people that I continue to see come back at our local meetings are the people that we spent time actually getting to know and that we spent time with. So, just, yeah. The final one is listen actively. I, I honestly think that that listening is a gift. But also, listening is going to give you that ability to connect. We don't listen more. We're attack at each other's society. When we actively listen, engage, un listen to understand, that civil discourse starts to take root. We can talk about why you have a view of that. But if I understand where you're coming from, and certainly would understand versus you're wrong, the understanding is going to allow you to have that conversation. Well, now I see why there's some aspects of libertarianism that we can't agree on. My understanding, my understanding <coughs> of listening actively is becoming a lost art. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. But it's a gift. Without curiosity and not listening, it's, it's tough for us to to, to move that, that discourse to a positive way, productive way. And I've often thought that we can apply this to the Libertarian Party, the, the candidates. I don't want someone going up, and I've trained the statewide candidates for the Libertarian Party in Minnesota. And I kind of channeled Harry Brown, where you appeal to the self-interest of each prospect or person. You can't do that without understanding potentially bringing a liberty solution on a local level. And so, yes, I've zigged when a lot of people have zagged and I'm proud of it. I have no qualms at saying that because I understand that by listening as a salesperson, as a career coach, I can better help them. I have helped people, professionals from all over the world, and when they're, when they're heard, we build that trust. When you're not being heard, there's not that trust that you have. Kevin, do you agree with that? You, but being heard is such a wonderful thing, because that trust starts to build, right? There's a great book out there by a local, I should say, Minnesota author, David Forsager, The Trust Edge, which is very good at what we're talking about here today. So Tyler, your thoughts on listening actively. You talk, you call it as a gift or someone. Yeah. You want to expound on that or any other aspect of this I'll just share one more story. It actually has to do with your coaching of our, our state gubernatorial candidate, Chris Holbrook. You, you kind of had this particular discussion yes. with him before going to the state fair. Yes, um, exactly. He'd, he'd come back, and uh, when you table events, obviously, you've got to talk to people. You've got a couple minutes, and they're probably usually on the way out. Um, he had come back and said he had you know, more meaningful conversations and brought more people in just to talk about what he was about, why he was running. You know, we're not only running just to support the military message, we're, we're running to give people more choices and to get the 5% that we need in Minnesota to not have to do all of this petitioning. And people, even though they're not libertarian, think it's about that we have to do petitioning, but nobody else has to. So he started kind of playing on that edge that he found that from people that that seems unfair. That doesn't even seem to be right. We're all, we all have freedom of speech. Why is our speech, their speech being subsidized or our speech being hindered simply because we have a different that kind of takes some, especially the Minnesota the nice uh, people, they got a little ticked off about it. So that's right, that's right. So I, I work firsthand in this work, and I'm checking time. So we've got 20 minutes. 
and I want to use the rest of this time to keep it interactive and have us share thoughts about any aspect of this, civil discourse, talking about different things. Are these three things something we can take to the field? I believe so. Go back to Larry, no one wants a top ten list. But if there's three, if, if one of us, and we've all probably done this, but sometimes just the reaffirmation of knowing that you're bringing curiosity and staying in the moment is just that, 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 that part of having that civil discourse. So I want to open it up right now. Share thoughts. I have a question. Has anybody been talked about this weekend? Like, have you been talking about walking? Yeah, talked about that. Somebody come up to you and just kind of start trying to handle whatever their agenda was. The gentleman back here that's taping it for the LP party, volunteering, by the way, thank you. You, you had? Well, I was just going to say I probably talked at somebody oh, and <laughs> did all the things wrong that you've been talking about. Okay. So uh, I guess I can't help you with what it's like being talked at. I'm sure it's happened, but. I've done it soon. I've done it soon. Let me ask you this. Would one of these three, something you would consider adopting to maybe not be in that position again? Absolutely, all three. Good. Do, do you see them as relevant? Thank you. That's feedback. We all fall into that. So you, you've been agreeing with me on a lot of those points. You look like a very successful person in, uh, in life, in a business. Has this type of method, methodology, benefited you? I love it. I mean, this is the way I operate. I, I tend to think that I operate that way because I could see myself. But then I was thinking very often because of limited time or anything. Come on, get on with it, you know? I want to see you with a proposal, with a, with a solution, with a, you know? So, so that's what I was kind of thinking. How do you move from all the, from the civil discourse, how do you move from discourse to action, to, to results? Mm -hmm. And it's, well, that's, that, that's what I was thinking, because perhaps that would be a, my weakness sometimes that I like too much to stay in the civil discourse and then where you move on to the to the action. Great thoughts. Well, just a couple of different like uh, so two different kind of scenarios come to my mind, right? You, your door knocking is one and the other one is building a party, like you're building a new membership. So when you're at the door you obviously have limited time. You're kind of broken into the house a little bit, you know, some people get a little off put because you're you're interrupting their day. And I know that if you've talked about it before kind of the time you had so you're knocking on the door. So usually, usually you just start off with uh, the idea that I'm only going to take a couple minutes of your time here. And then they can either let you in, like kind of permission-based. Um, and, and then you can go from there. The other piece, at least for me, because I'm right with you, the idea that you've got two, three, five minutes, maybe ten minutes, because you've got to go or something's going on. Um, for me, the idea has been, it's back to that kind of the growing or the, the setting of seeds, right? Um, I'm going to give this person a good first experience, not only maybe with a libertarian, but with me personally. Um, and we may not be able to build much in five minutes, but that five minutes is going to at least allow me the opportunity to get back with them at some future time. Um, uh, there's a, can't quote it off the top of my head, I have a psych degree, so the, there's a study actually uh, done about memory, um, and there's, a, there's essentially two points in time uh, with which memory is optimal. Things that are a long time ago, we've been able to kind of go through repetition and uh, they don't stay with decks of cards where they have people kind of flip through a deck of cards, they give them a limited amount of time. And the cards that are uh, memorized essentially shows up as like a you. So the things that they started uh, remembering originally come through the first experience. What I got from that is the, the, the first initial cards are always easy to remember for because it's their first, uh, first interaction. And the most recent cards are also the first what I drew from kind of like reading this and looking at it is that you only get one chance to make a, a first impression where you both have the recency effect and the latency effect lined up where you're going to have that first time. So I always try to make the first experience kind of fun, interactive, kind of good. I want them to have a positive feeling in their gut about me, even if we only get two minutes together. So Planting of seeds. Yeah. And, and if, if we're in the hyper world of wanting something now, you, you strike me as someone that wants to, you want to identify a solution for them. 
or a, a, a good resource, and you want to be a credible person to do that, it, it may be just managing their expectations. Just by saying, it may take a little longer, but I'm only doing it for the benefit of you and making sure I present the right information. We, we can't all get the information just by going on here. We have to ask questions. So it might be a managing expectations. Is that helpful? Yes, very helpful. Good, good. Let's keep it interactive. Who else would like to share some thoughts about uh, in recent about civil discourse? Who's had positive civil discourse where you walked away feeling uh, you had some information you didn't have and it was positive, positive, positive on both sides? Is there any conversations you've had, not just here at this convention, but within the last month or so that, you, that was refreshing? And that, I hope there's at least one that, you know, someone, it, it's happening. I've seen it this weekend, I've been a part of it. Yes, Kev. Um, well, Friday, um, before I came to the convention, I spoke at the uh, Salvation Army in, in Orlando. They heard I was coming. And that's part of my testimony is going from well, very well. And I was sharing with some of the guys there, um, you know, about uh, getting off the welfare and everything. And one guy wanted to argue that, you know, libertarians, Republicans, we just want to cut welfare, we don't want to help people, you know. Um, but what I began to do is to change the conversation, as uh, Scott was saying, to make it possible. Like, no, we don't want to cut something from you, but we want to make you self sufficient so you don't need it. And it, it was a, you know, it wasn't an easy transition because some people are stuck. You know, they've been thinking that way so long. But um, I was able to make it possible to know that, you know, we do, um, I want to present it in a different way, I guess is the best, the best way of saying it. Okay, I think that that's, um, Especially when people are arguing or they're like, you know, not even trying to compromise or hear what you're saying, but just say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but let's look at it a different way from a different point of view. And he actually, um, he was also really arguing about uh, people don't want to help and give, but I'm going to say, you know, you want to help yourself, and that's what it is. You know, don't just worry about other people giving or whatever, you know, what can you do for you? And at the end, he left a while, I, you know, I asked him always, um, what did you get out of this? And he said, well, I got out the fact that I should be trying to do something for me, not just looking at other people. So it did work. So you, Kevin, you planted the seed. <laughs> yeah. You did. Did you agree with that, Bill? Yeah. That, and that's an important seed. What if we gave him permission to kind of think about himself a little bit, too? Because it seems like he was potentially pushing back on the idea that he couldn't he couldn't even acknowledge that he might have needs that need to be met. Well done. Well done. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't an easy environment to to talk about that. You handled it well. That's good. That's good. Anybody, any other aspect? I had a very rare occasion. I'm oh, sorry. So how did you I had a very rare occasion of having a fruitful based conversation a few weeks ago with somebody who's in high school. Keyword is rare and fruitful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that's good. Or I got to explain the difference between positive and negative rights and how um, I think I found it was a Try to apply these principles. I feel like are a lot easier to apply on the internet, where I can actually like sit and think about what I'm saying rather than in person, where it's a lot easier to get emotional and yeah. um, just like how can you possibly think this way when all the evidence is so clear in my mind? Um, but it's it was I'm fine with learning. I feel like you'll ask questions and like okay, do you, do you see how this turns out? What are the effects of this? And do you understand these negative rights concepts? So, so social media. Is I'm hoping we all, yeah, I'm hoping we all actually get better at in person. <laughs> but it's just, it's just a slow process. I am getting better, it's just. Yeah, it, 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 it's a process. I've been in sales, so I've had people scream at me. And the first thing I think is I appear pleased. And I rephrase what they're mad about. And I learned this 25 years ago that I, I don't quit the jump, the anger. I appear pleased, rephrase it, and try to isolate. Is that what you're really mad about? Okay, well, if we were able to talk about this more productively, could we move forward? That is a sales technique that I've had for 25 years. Ty has known me, he's seen me. People have put me on the spot. And I embrace it, I really do. I, like I said, we're a big Irish Catholic family with seven siblings, I knew it was gonna be unproductive. 
and we really did. It's that Scandinavian influence from my mom. And, you know, the kept us passive, <laughs> passive aggressive. <but. coughs> it, it is a process. It really is. But try that. Try that. Be a pure please. Okay. Rephrase. So what you're saying is you disagree with me in regards to this. It also buys you a little time. Now you're in. And then I say, is that the one thing that is really? So it's just a simple method that I use. It's called ERIC, with an A, A R I C. And C is just for the close, but you don't need to close anybody. You're maybe just conclude or move, move forward. If that's helpful for you, try it. Up here, please, and rephrase. Yes. So I I go to a very small college, um, and what I've noticed when you know trying to engage in civil discourse apart from certain organizations on campus. What I've noticed is that a lot of the students at my school are just so deeply entrenched in their beliefs and and that's not inherently a bad thing, but it, the negative comes when they start to be dogmatic about it. And so it makes it very difficult to engage in this sort of positive exchange. So I'm trying to figure out how to how to get through that, and I definitely think that these three keys will help. But I'm still trying to figure out you know, how how to sort of dig through the dogma, to try to get people, you know, thinking more, I suppose, more critically for lack of a better term. There's a couple things. One is the because I've been put on the spot many times, especially when you're tabling, people come up. What do you think about black water murdering people in Iraq? You know, that's, they come get me and I was like, um, I was actually just going to go have a euro. Uh, <laughs> after this, you know? Um, um, so I, I feel you on that. So the Joe's method has helped a little bit on that. The other one is I ask a lot of questions. Um, and not, not necessarily pointed questions like, but just to learn about them. So I'll tell you a short story about the guy. I work with a guy named Jim. And Jim is basically a libertarian, but he has some just very kind of interesting uh, beliefs and values that kind of stuff hangs on. So he thinks that you should be able to drive around uh, with your motorcycle helmet, whether or not you want to. You know, your safety belt, the same thing, whether or not you want to. But social security, uh, he can't give it. He can't give it up. And so I started talking to him a little bit about it, and it turns out that Jim, he's probably probably about twice my age. His father was actually employed by the Social Security Administration for the entirety of his life. So when I talked to Jim, uh, I started finding out that he thinks, or he's probably truthful, that his family wouldn't have been fed as he was growing up, whether or not his dad had this, this job, because they got moved around for, for his job, or for his dad to go continue to work for the Social Security Administration. So there's a lot of things that are kind of pinned into that belief system. Um, and so we kind of started talking about that, about alternatives and what, so the history of Social Security, and kind of got down into that. And again, it's a little bit longer process, and it's good because I work with them, so we go out to lunch and stuff. So I have time to kind of meddle with them. But I found when I found out that piece, I feel like I understood where Jim was coming from almost completely. Um, so that might, that that's what I found useful, especially with people like him who I want to continue to build a relationship with. So plus, you may find that it, sometimes it's not possible. No. You have to find that that, that fruitful field. Mm -hmm. and is your word. You may, you're not going to, you, your, your job is not to convince. Your job is to help people grow. And not everybody's in a position in their life to grow. And so find more people willing. And I think you will feel better about it. And uh, you'll learn things about yourself. You learn things about them. And it may be the social media aspect too, you know, that helps you. It's complimentary. You know, if you choose to, social media and, and conversation. So, but you can't, some people, it's just not to be easy. You're not, it's not because of you. You can't control that aspect. But, some, but someday, I, I have an older brother who was born in a police house. He would be very mad on some of the views that I have. But I'm not mad at him. But he needs to have some personal growth in this conversation about marijuana legalization. But I also understand where he's coming from. But he needs to learn where I'm coming from. And I've got 14 year olds, so I'm a responsible father, but I also have to raise them. 
And so we have some conversations that only can go so far. And then I realize I have to discount. He's not there yet. That's my own older brother. Does, this, does that help me for you to take back to college? Yeah, yeah, it does. I suppose I just, you know, had this sort of pre-existing belief that, you know, by the time we got to that point, you know, we'd be ready for this sort of, for the, for the, I suppose, that level of growth. But, you know, people hearing that, it helps to help me realize that, you know, sometimes different people ask just take, you know, different times, you know, to get, to get to a point where they are, you know, ready. And They use the image of you can't plant a seed in concrete. Right. You can't plant a seed in, in, in rocks. You have to find fruitful soil. Mm -hmm. and so maybe that person you're talking to is is, is not in that right that fr frame of life. We all have to understand where we're all at. Mm -hmm. yeah. I work with people where they're all in their careers and so forth. They may not be open but at that point, but never give up. Well, the other commission said yesterday um, during his time, I think he may have actually uh, uh, kind of percolated on that a little bit that if we could change their beliefs so easily, you know, the next minute they kind of walk away and they're like, uh, commercial, then their belief could change again. So it is on some level good that we have to struggle with people to get their, you know, to get them to move, because then once we move them and we show them, you know, our logic and our, our evidence, it'll be as hard to move them back or to move them in another direction. So it's, so. And Adam would, would admit to himself that he's moved that, that Zen libertarianism, that he was, you know, he said in his presentation, he's had professional growth, and it's, and it's you know, where he was eight, nine years ago to where he is today. So hopefully that's helpful. Sir, you have, you want to, you were going to make a comment, I certainly want to Oh, uh, I hang out at a bar with a lot of left-wing people, Bernie Sanders type people. Okay. And they came in after a rally and really against the top 1%. And they said, we need a 90% tax on the rich, on the super rich. This will cure all our problems. And I told them that I remember when it was the top rate was 70%, Ronald Reagan reduced it to 28%. I said, you know what happened in seven years? The amount of money that came in, the revenue doubled. Didn't go down by 40%. The amount of money that came in doubled. And I challenged them to go Google it and prove me wrong. The next week, I hit the tap on the shoulder. It's one of these guys. But instead of conceding the point, he said, you know what? Reagan ran a, you know, a, a half a trillion dollar deficit or something. And I said, yeah, but there's two different concepts here. One is revenue coming in. And he was dealing with the Democratic Congress that was spending money like as a drunken sailors. But they, they kind of fuzzed it all up to essentially refute my argument of wealth creation, that you'll actually take in more money by lowering taxes. And it seems counterproductive. Like, what, would you be kidding me? How can you take in more money if you lower taxes? And when I tried to point out the facts to them, you know, they were, you know, stymied or just, you know, glossed it over. But it sounded like you did, that one individual wanted to check it. He, well, he did, yeah. And he went on some left-wing website, an anti-Reagan website, that said that this caused the deficit. Well, we took in twice as much money. But spending exploded under a Democratic con uh, Congress. I tried to tell him, you know, you got to separate the two. They won't do it. Our society will improve if we can have a more productive, critical thinking conversation. I love that phrase. Critical thinking conversations between the generations. We have, we've all grown up at different times. My father was a World War II veteran. I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I, and I feared the Soviet Union. I feared them. I was worried. And now I counsel people from the former Soviet Union in, in career transition. Very, very well seasoned, high degree professional. And so, you know, but the younger people in this world will not know what we feared from the Soviet Union back in the 80s, right? At any point we thought, right? But think about, you know, people from World War II and what they were thinking. When, when the question in the debates about Hiroshima and dropping a bomb, the second bomb, 
in the context then, if you're in Europe and Japan keeps fighting, guess what those people in the soldiers in Europe are going to do? And my father was stateside. And my uncle, ready to go. They won't care about who they But you have to understand where they're coming from. So we're up against the 2 o'clock hour, and I respect everybody's time. But we are going to be around here for a little while. Um, and I hope, I hope we've given you something. One of the last days of the convention here to go back to our hometowns. Certainly, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We have our contact information on the back. We are open to, to working with folks, um, candidates, parties. We need as a society to restore civility in your conversation and not talking at people but talking to them. And what's your closing thoughts on this whole topic? There so we go. Right back to Harry Brown. Uh, I resolve to remind myself that someone's stupid opinion may be an opinion I once held. If I can grow, why can't I help That was the core of our first topic, that quote right there. I believe that quote's going to follow us from here on. Do you agree, Ty? Oh, yeah. Think about that. So...